Hello, hello. It's time for Leading Women in Tech. I'm your host, Tony Collis, and today I'm talking about the unique and specific attributes of tech leadership. Whether you are an engineer leader, you're an HR leader, you're at legal, you're finance, you're sales, you're marketing. I always say those and I'm like, what else am I missing? <laughs> there are unique and specific things, particularly for us as women, that as leaders in a tech organization, we need to do a little bit differently. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you've ever wondered what sets tech apart from other industries, and by tech, we're quite an inclusive bunch. I think the automotive industry, for example, is coming into tech. There are a lot of the similar challenges. You may have thought, well, I'm also a woman and I'm aware that things are a little bit different for us, which by the way, they are. That's why I have a job. And learning how to navigate and thrive in what is a wonderful field. The world of tech is beautiful, fabulous, great place to be, but also with its own set of barriers, blockers and minefields. So today I'm going to dig into some simple strategies. We're going to undiagnose first of all what's going on, but dig into some simple strategies to address these blockers that I see with all the women I coach. I'm going to talk to you about how tech is distinct from other industries, irrespective of your specific role and why the standard tactics do not work. And we'll check in on those sadly common challenges faced by us as women in tech leadership that I don't see coming up the same way in other organizations, as well as some practical strategies to address all of these challenges head on. So let's dig in to impact with practical insights and strategies tailored just for you and who you are in a tech leader role. Leading in tech today is a unique challenge and an opportunity. Even if your role isn't directly technical, one significant difference is the rapid pace of technological change. I'm sure you know this, but we have constant innovation. This is why I think some of the companies that are now kind of joining tech, and I mentioned automotive, fintech, finance, I think banks in general, there are the old pieces of banks the traditional operations, but a lot of what goes on in the back office, I would say, by back office, I mean huge offices, is very technical. They operate like tech companies. Many of my clients work for big banks and call themselves tech companies. And we're seeing lots of trends, things emerging in unprecedented rates, the adoption of technology, in not just in terms of like innovation, but in terms of what we need to be doing with it. Whether you're in marketing, sales, HR, understanding the latest technological developments is crucial. It isn't just if you're an engineer. You have to understand how what you do aligns with the goals of the company and how you need to use technology to do that. You have to be adaptable, forward thinking. You have to be looking at how to integrate technology to enhance efficiency and drive progress. And the way you do that is different. I think how we need to operate, the old style of operation just doesn't work. There's an expectation for us to use different tools, for us to encourage ownership. I was rereading a very old HBR article not that long ago about how some apparently previously successful leadership and management techniques just don't work in innovative cultures because they block learning. We want our team to take responsibility for their own behavior. We want them to share information about what they do, their role, their organization. We want the team to be empowered, shape lasting change. Now, historically, we'd have managed by walking around, something that the hybrid and remote environments do not allow. A frustration I know has caused many in management to advocate for return to the office. Quite frankly, that's lazy management. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is how actually that old style of management is part of the problem because we miss the point. What worked 20 years ago does not work for the type of companies that are competitive today. This isn't just that used to work, it simply doesn't work today. We no longer want employees who simply do what they are told. If you have that old style of management, you are expecting, unconsciously at least, for your team to just do what they're told. Today, it's more about being individually accountable. It's not about presenteeism. But we fall into this old style of being present is important. But then we say we want them to bring their whole selves to work. 
so I'm sorry, but being present is not bringing your whole self to work. If you are um, neurodivergent, if you are an introvert, like it, a lot of the time, those two things are mutually incompatible. You can't be always present and do your best work and bring your whole self to work. Those things do not all come together for all people. We want people to make mistakes, but the old style of management vilifies it. We don't have psychological safety. And most important, when we make mistakes, it can also be embarrassing and threatening to our careers. An old style of leadership didn't embrace that. It doesn't motivate learning and doesn't produce real change. I sigh whenever I hear another well-intentioned HR leader, and I've coached a lot of HR, HR leaders in tech at this point. Whenever I hear a very well-intentioned HR department, HR leader doing employee surveys and focus groups, I get, I get it. I've done it. I'm an advocate for them in a certain place. Many great companies rely on these. I mean, almost all of the big corporations I work with, and I right now I'm so we've got about half of, I'd say about 20 different big corporations. My my team and I coach somebody in some, some of them, we've got multiple people in the same corporation, big companies, like Fortune 500 companies, right? And they, they will be putting out these quarterly surveys, annual surveys. And I know firsthand from the people I coach that employees just don't take them seriously. They will fill them in the first couple of times. If it's mandatory, they will continue filling them in. I heard a horror story recently, which is, it wasn't public knowledge in this organization, but the bonuses, the bonuses were based on, for the particular team, were based on how many of the team filled in the quarterly survey. But this wasn't public knowledge. If they didn't get a high enough proportion of the team filling in the survey, it affected the individual bonuses. And you're just like, well, what? You can see how that comes about, right? You want high engagement in employee surveys. And so we, we're going to bonus on that because that means our managers are doing a good job. The problem is you're affecting the individuals and you're not being transparent about it. And in addition, you're actually measuring the wrong metric there. If people aren't filling in employee surveys, it's because there's something wrong with an employee survey. Not necessarily because of bad management by the individuals or the managers that are in managing them. So don't bonus based on an employee survey. Ask yourself, well, why are they not filling it in? If you actually really need people to fill in it, be honest about it. I think one of the reasons people get so jaded with them is because we see putting in this information, but nothing actually changes. We're filling them in every quarter. We, we make our comments, nothing changes. We ask ourselves, why are we being honest? The longer you've been there, the more cynical you get about how much they genuinely protect your privacy. I personally have been in a very toxic executive meeting when the lead of that meeting asked IT, can we find out who submitted this to an employee complaint? They were like, I want the IP address of this computer. I'm going to figure out who this is and go and have an honest conversation with them. And you think to yourself, no wonder people don't say anything. That fear is valid and real because at the end of the day, yeah, you can get IP addresses, right? Anybody who's got a technical background like me knows that and you get very careful. So the old style and, and you know, employee service is seen as a modern thing to help us with DEIB. And I'm just telling you right there, they do not work. Another thing that really is broken is bringing in external consultants to fix issues. Identify opportunities for scaling, find optimizations in the organization. And then the next level down of management goes, thank God they came in. And you ask the question, why? We've known there's been an issue. It's good to have change. Why were they not listened to? They knew what needed to change. Time and time again, you'll find out that it's blindness and timidity of management. Senior management weren't listening or there was a perception of them not listening. The managers who actually knew on the ground what was wrong didn't have the courage or the ear of the people to actually pass that upwards. Maybe couldn't articulate it well enough. Whatever the reason, there was a lack of communication. There was a true understanding this is a problem and there was a lack of communication upwards. Bring in an external organization, pay a truckload of money to do it, suddenly get pay attention, right? 
Why was that necessary? Blindness, bonusing teams against teams so they don't feel they should work together. That competitiveness you get between departments, between teams, which just seems a good thing, means that nobody feels responsibility to fix the things that fall between the cracks. Everyone says, not my problem. And this, this issue is all around us in tech and is exacerbated by our bonus culture of bonusing teams against each other. It's exacerbated by our employee surveys and the lack of honesty we actually feel that we can genuinely have. And then when you get the the information about it, even if there's a report out, we found out this in our employee survey, nothing seems to change. You don't feel psychologically safe. What are you doing to build psychologically safe, safety in your team? When you have an innovation-driven culture, whatever part of the organization you work in, if your culture is tech, it is probably innovation-driven. Then you have an emphasis on fostering continuous innovation, creativity. To do that, you need space. You need psychological safety. You need ownership. You need people feeling safe to take risks, exploring new ideas without repercussions. They need to know when they put in their monthly report, their bosses are going to go... You didn't do enough this month. Instead, they need to be asking questions such as, what went well, what didn't go well, what would you do differently next time? This ability to nurture is essential, and yet it's not done enough. By the way, this is where, as women, we really come in. Because, as you've heard me talk about before, if you've listened to this podcast, as women, we navigate a knife edge. Early in management, men get to mess around on a playing field. There's a lot of forgiveness for making mistakes. They don't have to be perfect. Women, we have to be perfect. We have a knife edge. Part of that knife edge is recognizing everything I'm talking about here, everything. And when you do that, you will nurture more. You will create more psychological safety. You will understand how your team really needs to operate. Now, you then become the buffer between the people above you and the people below you. You're making uh, adjustments for their needs because you know that's how they're going to be innovative. You know that's how they're going to be psychologically safe. You know that's when they're going to come to you without fear of repercussions for where they've messed up, taken risks, which could lead to something great, but they just need to chew it through with somebody who isn't going to judge them for messing up on the last five minutes. That's where we come in. Because that's a skill that so much of the time, you only get much higher up in your organization. And sometimes when you don't even need it as much, because you are far enough up, you do less of that because the people below you are more experienced they need less handholding. The place we really need it is those director levels and below. Once you get to the VP, it's important. Don't get me wrong. All of this applies everywhere. But you tend to only learn it if you're a man higher up in your career. And at that point, it's important, but it's not going to make or break the company. And what I was saying is that as women, because we're held to this higher standard, which is unfair, I will always say that it's unfair. But the silver lining is when we figure this out, amazing things happen. One of the things I also see with such a highly skilled workforce is that we need that delicate balance between technical expertise and soft skills, communication, collaboration, understanding. Historically, as tech, (laughs) we have prioritized technical prowess over interpersonal skills. In my notes for this episode, I write notes for every episode to make sure I touch all the points I really am passionate about. And I've underlined the word, sometimes led to challenges. And I'm like, is it sometimes? Like, really? When we prioritize technical prowess, I, there, our team breaks down, quite frankly. Team IQ, we know team IQ decreases when you allow toxicity because that person over there is brilliant, don't you know? I can't believe we're still having this conversation in 2024 when I'm recording this. Why are we still in this place where we think it's acceptable to have bad behavior and poor collaboration because that person's brilliant? Team IQ always outperforms individual IQ, but individual IQ isn't the thing that makes team IQ work. And in fact, if you prioritize the individual over the team, your team will never do well. Your team IQ will be less than the sum of the parts. This is a crucial. And yet this shift for what I'm going to call the old guard, and I don't mean old, I mean old-fashioned, 
the old guard of leadership, old-fashioned leadership. Whereas a scarcity of role models and coaches who understand this and provide guidance on these. This is why tech, I think, is not going as far or as fast as it can be. So much of what I see causing startups to fail, quite frankly, is poor leadership. Because a lot of those leaders and startups have their experience from role models who are the old guard. They're working in an innovative environment. They think, oh, you know, I know how to do this. Like, I work in tech. But their leadership is so old-fashioned. Which brings me to another piece, data-driven decision-making. This should be obvious, right? I actually just been writing a set of training from my leadership program on different types of leadership, transformational leadership, collaborative leadership. One of them is analytical leadership. And I, when I was doing my research, I was astonished by how few companies really understand proper data-driven decision-making. We think we make decisions based on data, but so much of it is emotional. No, there is a place for that. There really is. Sometimes you have to go with your gut. And I'm a big believer in trusting that, right? But we also need to have the right data in front of us to inform our gut, right? And not just dismiss it because we disagree with it. If you don't agree with it, dig into why. <laughs> By always get some more data, but don't just stop getting data when you've got the bit you agree with. The ability to interpret and act on data is essential to stay ahead. And yet so many of us do not actually do it. We think we are, but we're not. The other one, which I've already talked about previously is remote work, re hybrid work. It is higher in tech, uh, particularly during COVID. Tech was one of the industries that kept going. But to do that, we had to work from home with huge move to remote and hybrid work. There is a move back again, which some of us, myself included, disagree with. I think there should be more of an option there. But because Genuinely speaking, I think this is more to do with the inability of a leader to manage a remote team rather than actually how good the remote team is. Some of the best companies in the world are 100% remote and they do great. So whenever I hear somebody say, oh, we don't actually do that well remotely, I'm like, it's because you don't know how to manage. Now, here's the other side of it. A lot of companies, I've had this conversation so many times with HR leaders that I've coached who are negotiating with a CEO who wants everybody back in the office but they're aware, HR is aware, if they force the tech team, the engineers, back into the office, they'll lose the entire team. And then there becomes this tension across the company because some of the workforce, if you're in a particular role, gets to work remote. The rest of you've got to be in the office. That immediately puts everybody on the back foot. We already have this idea that some teams are treated better than others because of pay, aside from anything else. You put in different conditions like that, you're just going to make everybody angry. And it is all because of this management gap, this ability to manage mastering digital communication, collaboration tools, fostering connection at a distance, even if you've never met in person. I've only met one of my 12 person team in person, one of them. And that was because I happened to be in her city and I was like, we're totally mean up. <laughs> and everybody else in my company, I've never met them in person. And yet, I mean, other than I am very respectful of their boundaries, I'm like, my team, my best friends, <laughs> like they're amazing. I'm very respectful of their boundaries. I do not refer to our company as a family. I think that is a toxic phrase. But honestly, these, the people I work with are just extraordinary. Hey, one of them is editing this right now. Send you a, send you a big hug. <laughs> and I, you know, I couldn't do that if I didn't know how to manage a remote team and thrive with a remote team. And my whole team hadn't got on board with this. It's critical. And it reflects what we need to do as an industry. So I want to talk now about being a woman in this industry as well. This adds that other layer of complexity on what is already demanding with very few good role models. We have to be able to address both of these for us to thrive and to have an impact. Of course, the first thing is bias and stereotypes, right? We face biases. The people undermine our contributions, our leadership potential. We are told we're not good enough. We're not going to get promoted. There's discrimination happening, conscious and unconscious. It is, it is a real thing. And I could tell you horror stories and it breaks my heart that today it's still happening. We have to work to overcome 
these preconceived notions about our abilities, about our resilience, about our proactive approach, about our ability to take risks or make good decisions. We do have to consistently demonstrate our expertise and value. And we are also on the back foot, not just externally from these biases and um, stereotypes, but because of our social conditioning. If you have been raised in the Western world as a woman, you are likely socially conditioned to keep everybody happy. That's the people pleasing piece. You are socially conditioned that you shouldn't earn as much money as men. Even if you're angry about it, when it comes to negotiation, we are on the back foot. We're socially conditioned that we don't talk over each other. I totally do that though, <laughs> right? So there's, I could go on. The list is enormous for our social conditioning. Much of it, hopefully you've started to overcome. It won't apply to every single one of us in all aspects, but there is social conditioning. Is there right? There is for men. I, think I was just talking to my coach this morning about social conditioning for men. Men find it a lot harder to earn less than women or to take time off to do childcare because society says men's job is to bring home the money for the family. It's like us with people pleasing. You can recognize it's stupid, doesn't make it easy to turn off and it's so hard to step over that social conditioning. So we've not just got the external biases and stereotypes, we've got our own social conditioning and the social conditioning of the men that we work with who like protect women. That is there, right? They might not even know it, but there is a social conditioning to protect women in much of society. Apparently it doesn't always manifest because otherwise we wouldn't have half the problems we do, but that's where we're at, right? We've got to balance all of this. As women, we're also in the position where we're often the caregivers. We've got work-life responsibilities. Even if you are not a carer, whether it's for elderly people, younger people, kids, there is still the pressure of a lot of us do more housework, do more project management of family obligations, and it can be overwhelming. I'm very lucky that my husband and I really have learned over the years to, to collaborate on that. There have been times when I have taken a back step from managing family obligations, even though I'm way better, and my husband would say this, I'm way better at logistics than he is. I find it naturally less overwhelming. He is not a logistics person. But there have been times when I've had to be like, I can't, I can't do this right now. My work is taking this from me and I don't have it to give. But I know I'm incredibly unusual to be able to have that conversation. I think I would like to say that many men are open to helping, but you've got to be able to have that conversation in the first place when we've just behaved this way our entire lives. And so have they. (laughs) I, I, I can't sit on the sofa while my husband does housework. I just cannot. I know many men who, who it just doesn't seem to bother them when somebody around them does housework. They will just sit there reading a book or watching TV. I honestly like the people pleasing was like, I can't do that. It's really hard. And again, I've seen this so many times. What we have to do is figure out a balance. We have to maintain our well-being and have space for our careers. We also have to recognize we can feel very isolated as women. There's a lack of female role models. Some of the role models are, quite frankly, unhelpful. (laughs) Their queen bee syndrome is still a thing. There is still a misconception. There's not enough room for all of us. Peers can lead to a sense of isolation because they don't behave or look like us. We find it difficult to find support, mentorship. And as we rise up in our careers, you'll also find you can't have the same conversations anyway, irrespective of your gender. When you have a peer early on, they're doing similar work to you. You can chew things over, use them to solve problems. If you do that higher up, you'll just piss people off because it's like, I'm not getting anything from this conversation. I am basically just here coaching you. And I got my own job and my own deadline, thank you very much. Because at that point, your peers aren't experts in what you do anymore. In fact, at some point, your boss is not an expert in what you do. A lot of coaching is about providing space for solving the problems that your boss doesn't have time to chew through with you. As a senior executive, A lot of the coaching we do for senior executives is being that person to chew things through with. Now, we can do things to improve this situation. We can have coaches. We can participate in women's networks, 
If you haven't already, go join the Leading Women in Tech community on Slack. We're small, we're quite quiet, but I would love to grow that and, and make this a free space for women in tech to communicate and find some needed guidance. I can't do it though. I would love to be able to coach every single one of you, but not everybody can afford coaching. And also there's only one of me and all that my team's growing, we're small, right? And what we want to do is take away that little piece of pain because we need to know as women how to navigate these unique and complex challenges, up level our careers more effectively because only then are we actually going to change things. But then we get back on track. We are supposed to be talking about leadership more generally. (laughs) One of the other balancing acts we've got to do as women, especially in tech, is advocating for ourselves strongly. I say especially in tech because being on the back foot as one of only a few women in your organization means that there is that unconscious bias. You aren't as visible. You are less likely to gain recognition. If you work in a more female-dominated environment, simply that change makes you more visible. You're no longer ignorable in the same way. Now that might sound really strange because surely if you're the only person that looks your way, then you're not ignorable, you're more visible, but that's not how it works, right? It's our ideas and our actions, the positive ones, the ones that keep us valuable, that can be ignored. We want it to be passed over for high visibility projects. We're less likely to be asked for things when you look the same, it's, it is more about your capabilities. So we've got to develop our, our personal brand. We In July, in July, in June, my entire community, my coaching community, we were focusing on personal branding. And they were like, oh, I don't like personal branding. And I'm like, okay, it's not what you think it is. It is, your personal brand is literally how everybody sees you. You have a brand whether you like it or not. But knowing how to leverage it, knowing how to make sure you have a particular reputation rather than just quietly allowing other people to decide who you are and what you do enhances our influence and even enhances our reputation across the entire industry, not just in our own organizations. We've also got to deal with culture. There's a lot of great diversity and inclusion organizations out there now. What I am seeing is smaller companies struggle with this. And I understand that it's an overhead. We want to have championing for diversity and inclusion, belonging. We want future generations to feel this. But equally, we shouldn't not work for small companies just because they don't have ERGs, just because they don't have lots to spend for this kind of work. What we actually want to be championing is a driving cultural change, a driving how women and other groups are heard an opportunity for obstacles to be removed, to be identified. It's been like what I said at the beginning, you hire a consultant and suddenly you take seriously the things your managers have known all along. What we want to be doing is listening to our team about what can we do to actually make people feel more included without lots of fancy, expensive activities. Because this should actually be about how everybody shows up every day not just you put on an event or there's an ERG or don't get me wrong, those have their places. I'm not dismissing those. But we need to know as women leaders who are then, whether we like it or not, often the face for a bit of diversity, only a little bit, depends what else is going on. But we are one very obvious piece of diversity in an organization. We are there for a role model. We're a role model for how an organization can adapt and improve challenge the status quo, lead with impact. And by the way, address some of the stereotypes that go along with being a woman. And hopefully, sometimes you can address the stereotypes that go along with being something that's just not white male, right? I I think the thing that astonished me when I was running women in high performance computing was how the work we did, and I, my leadership team, we were predominantly white women. There are not very many women of color in supercomputing. And it was astonishing to me how many other people came out and said, you've given us a voice. Um, male colleagues who were didn't feel that they fitted the stereotype. The work we do can have an impact on more than just the other women. And that is so important, so important. It is a huge burden, but if you want to be a good leader, this is part of what we do. Let me get back on track to the technological change piece, though. I don't want to just talk about 
our agenda the whole time. Well, that is a big piece of it. Part of what we need to do as tech leaders or leaders in the tech industry, I should say, is ensuring that our team remains agile and is able to cope with being rapid and fast evolving. And again, this applies beyond just a tech team, if you like. Agility, and I don't mean agile methodology per se, the agility is about being nimble and flexible. Part of the tech industry is about rapid evolution. That's how it stays relevant. It's kind of the definition of tech. It's, it's always at the forefront. You need a culture of adaptability, of resilience. People are prepared to tackle changes head on. As I said earlier, this is about creating a psychologically safe environment. People need to be able to take risks. You need to reward innovation and reward mistakes. And that sounds so odd. And I will say all the time though, reward failure and mistakes. Because what you're saying is, we appreciate that you tried. What can we learn from it? Rather than you try that and it went wrong, don't do it again. You need a culture of regular brainstorming sessions without people feeling that they're being criticized. You need to make sure everybody's heard. You need workshops to cultivate a culture of creativity. Now, a tech team may well do an off-site brainstorming session, but there's other ways to do this. It should just be part of your operating procedure. Get fresh perspectives. Have space for innovation. Don't just shut them down. When you have a highly skilled workforce, though, it is also hugely about communication. Great communication delivers all sorts of benefits. When you actively listen and have space for feedback, hold space for feedback to you, hold space for criticism without being defensive. When you are vulnerable and authentic, you provide psychological safety. It's so incredibly important for empowering your team, giving them ownership, delegating responsibilities, trusting them to execute, provide opportunities for them to grow because they are talking to you about what they want. Also, with a high skill team, remember, they want growth opportunities. They have educated themselves to a certain point. They therefore want to see their career grow. They want to be in a culture of autonomy and accountability. After all, I hate it when I hear people say, oh, this person doesn't know how to work. I don't know how they've ever got on in life. Well, they've got here. At some point, they had the gumption to go out and get some certifications or qualifications and land a job. We all know landing a job is not stress-free, right? When there's genuinely a problem with performance, there's something else going on. How can we look at what we're doing to prevent stress from micromanagement, burnout from a lack of ownership? When we are looking at communication, what are we doing to communicate beyond just the verbal? Again, it comes back to remote and hybrid. Are you using Slack? Are you using Zoom? Are you using project management software? Are you using clear guidelines and expectations for remote work? Are you monitoring everything people do on their computer, like keystroke loggers. <laughs> the UK, where I'm based, we um we have rules around monitoring software. I'm not entirely sure what they are. Thankfully, I've never worked for an organization that has done that to me. Um, I know, though, um, one of my friends works for a big organization and her husband, <laughs> she works from home four days a week and the software on her computer gets flagged on their security software on their router by her, that her husband's installed because he's in tech. And it's just like, wow, it looks like somebody's, looks like somebody's stalking you and stealing all your information. Um, a lot of organizations want to have your camera on to monitor what you're doing, how often you step away from the computer. That does not promote ownership and psychological safety. That is, we want you in the office, but we recognize we can't get you into the office but we still don't trust you. Whatever happened to realizing it's about how much we deliver, not even how much, but the quality of what we deliver rather than presenteeism. One other thing I want to just touch back on with our gender is emulating men. Again, this is something I've seen trip up a lot of women who are trying to get ahead. They think, oh, I'm not getting ahead as me, so I'm just going to look like the men around me. When you emulate men, it doesn't work for you, right? Men can be more assertive than we can be and get away with it. They can gossip and we can't get away with it. 
they can interrupt. We can't get away with it. Now, here's the thing. Again, when we learn how to advocate for ourselves and behave the right way, we will overtake the men who behave that way. Executive presence for men is not the same thing as executive presence for women. I hate that that's true, but it is. What I would argue is the executive presence I teach is actually superior for both genders. (laughs) But if you just look for executive presence techniques from your male peers by emulating them, by observing and copying them, you will fall flat on your face. If not immediately, then soon thereafter. Building an advocacy network is also crucial. Again, this speaks to everybody, but is even more important for us as women. You need people who can say, that's a great idea, Sally. Can you tell us more? And people who will hold space for you in a meeting and make sure that you get the ear of the person that you need to have. When we do all this, we can become better leaders. We can, we will, I would assert. We are overcoming the unique challenges of both being in tech and the unique challenges of being a woman in leadership. Put all that together, you're going to have more impact, more confidence. You're going to go further with more ease. I do want to just take a moment to go through some of what we talked about today. There's a lot here. If in doubt, rewind, hit 2x, take some notes. (laughs) We want to be talking about fostering continuous learning encouraging experimentation, developing our communication skills, not just emulating the men around us, navigating challenges, leading with impact, dealing with data, all stuff that you've probably heard, but have you actually looked at how you were doing it and how it's going down with those around you? Are you looking at actively enhancing your visibility? Have you got a strong advocacy network? What obstacles are you facing? What do you need to be doing specifically to overcome them? Effective leadership isn't just about staying ahead with the latest tech. It's about having supportive, innovative environments where your team thrives. At the end of the day, you'll get to a certain point in your organization where you are doing the tech. You are sending the strategy, you're delivering the strategy through your team. You are not hands on keyboards. This is all about your team. I encourage you to come join us in Leading Women in Tech. Have this conversation. Head over to the show notes to get this link to the Slack community. Have a think about psychological safety tools, what you need to do as a woman to effectively communicate. And of course, if you want to take this step further, come and talk to me or my team about what it looks like to get some one-on-one coaching on your leadership skills and elevating your career. Thank you for joining me today. Remember that leading with impact starts with embracing our strategy. So let's continue this. Come back, hear more next week and head over to my community and join me. Remember, until next time, stay in your technician game, follow your dreams, because the world really does need that uniqueness that you bring as a leading woman in tech.